Hey guys. I was thinking whether or not it's um, the situation of Muslims in the United States is similar to Jews under uh, Germany's uh, political system right around the 1930s. And if you don't already know, from what I understand, in 1932, uh, the National Socialists were elected. Uh, and then what ended up happening was that party that was democratically elected then appointed um, you know, Adolf Hitler to, I, th I believe it was a chancellor. And from that point on, right afterwards, a lot of Jewish refugees uh, you know, left the country. And one of them was Einstein in 1933. As a refugee, he left the country. And although he wasn't directly involved in the Manhattan Project, he was instrumental in recommending somebody else, um, whose last name I can't pronounce. It starts with, you know, an S-Z. And, you know, that person eventually, you know, went on to develop um, a powerful military weapon uh, that enabled the United States to win World War II. Now, there's no way to really predict all these things, you know, when they happen in real time. Although it's true that intelligence agencies all over the world, you know, they scout people at academic conferences. And they try to, just like every other country, uh, try to capture the best and the brightest um, to help them, you know, to enable them to succeed in an era where information and knowledge are the most powerful weapons of all. So, you know, in America, if you are a minority, uh, a true minority, which means that you don't have political representation, and I believe the Muslims in America have uh, Keith Ellison, and, that may, and maybe one more person, um, but if you look at the way that he was treated um, by, you know, talk show hosts and so on, including one person called Glenn Beck, who, uh, you know, essentially questioned his loyalty because of his religion um, on television, uh, asking Mr. Ellison, you know, prove to me that you're not, you know, a terrorist or prove to me that you're not somebody who's un American. Um, prove to me that you're on our side. Essentially assuming that a person's religion, in this case Islam, would be contrary to the values of the of his or her country, despite Ellison being a citizen and so on. So that's that's again something you see it's not quite as dramatic and as tangible as say, you know, people throwing rocks. Um, you know, through broken glass of, you know, minority-owned businesses. That kind of thing doesn't necessarily happen as much simply because the way the economic model works is that you have a lot of partners, they're not necessarily visible, um, and ultimately you have to look more and more to the intangible and to self-restraint to see whether or not tolerance actually exists. So in the old days, you could segregate people, and that's exactly what the, um, what the Germans did. They put people in ghettos. And that really was a way to, I'm trying to think of the word, you know, these actions are so contrary to how I think that it's difficult for me sometimes to come up with language that adequately describes or accurately describes what was really happening at that time. But if you, when you segregate people, and that's actually one of the, the largest problem America has today is segregation, even today. And that's why a lot of its decisions uh, legally, whether it's Brown versus Board of Education or Today, when you have a charter school system uh, that's trying to create options, uh, minimizing educational segregation, that's why these are such contentious issues. And one of the reasons I keep looking east is because, you know, people might be poor in, in the east, but there's less segregation. And so if you take a bus, if you take a train system in Bangkok, um, you see rich and poor. And if you go to Japan, which has very few poor people, um, at least in Tokyo, you know, you go to and then you go to the, the train station um, where the signs are in English and Japanese, and if you, even if you don't speak any language, uh, there's a picture, a pictorial that'll allow you on the video to to get to where you're going. Um, when you have a system that uh, that in its fundamental foundation allows everyone to be included, you bypass many issues that America is suffering from today. But you know, and again, the, the key issue is trying to avoid segregation, which is a very difficult thing. It's probably the most difficult thing, um, simply because the reason that people segregate is because they want to minimize their own problems. Nobody wants to live next door to a drug dealer, or nobody wants to live next door to a criminal, or somebody who is disrespectful, or who lives a life that is contrary to the principles that they themselves believe, uh, that their neighbors believe, right? Um, and in, in general, that's, that's true everywhere. So how do we bring people together? How do we put diverse people with different opinions in the same neighborhood? Well, one way is simply, you know, is, is not to give them an option to move. Small places like Hong Kong or Singapore 
um, you know, there's no other place to go. Singapore is the most successful country in Southeast Asia as of today. Uh, there's no reason for anyone to want to move anyplace else. Um, so same thing with Hong Kong. Um, you know, the passport might be, you know, different from mainland China, uh, but most people in Hong Kong would prefer at least, you know, I'm, I'm not saying all of them, but many of them would prefer to simply to stay in Hong Kong uh, rather than go to a, an as-developed city like Shanghai or Beijing or, you know, Guangzhou or Guangzhou. Guangzhou. Um, and so you have these situations where people are locked in, whether because of their families or whether because of the size of their country. Um, but America, of course, you know, is, is the exact opposite. We have a huge country and perhaps only 10 cities that would be considered mega cities that you could compare with a Tokyo or a Toronto um, or so on. Now, how do you create, you know, this, this, this system that works so well in terms of attracting talent from all over the world? And one way that we've just discussed is, is war and refugees um, and trying to use your intelligence services uh, to identify people that might be valuable to your country because of their knowledge or um, of their skill set and to bring them in. And in doing so, reap unexpected benefits. And even, even if it's not quite, quite so dramatic as enabling the Manhattan Project, uh, even if it's simply, you know, they have a child, they take care of that child, uh, or they contribute in other ways that are oftentimes intangible to their community, which, which is, you know, just simply being kind to the, to the people around them, that intangible enables a community. That's what actually creates a community that one would want to live in, the kind, of, the kind where people do things based on, you know, tolerance and kindness. And you know, even when I say those words, I, I feel like I'm sort of um, using words that have almost lost our meaning um, or that, that are you know, subject to caricature be simply because we, we've forgotten what that means. And it's more likely that when somebody uses the word tolerance today in America, it's, it's going to be in a mocking sort of way. And that's, again, another sign of this intangible. These intangible signs are what I want people to look for. Uh, it's not just talk show hosts questioning um, you know, elected representatives about their loyalty on national TV. Um, it's, it's a lot of other things. You know, do, do your neighbors look out for each other, uh, just regardless of uh, political opinions? You know, how, how is that? What is, what is the real sense of community in a particular place? And, and I just read something today that said that, you know, although in America, people, parents no longer, you know, mind whether their, their daughter or their son marries somebody else of a different race or religion, they do mind much more than 50 years ago, uh, you know, whether or not the person is of the same political party. And again, that's a very stunning sort of uh, progression, uh, simply because it means that we've apparently managed to, if you believe the data, uh, overcome a lot of the problems uh, that other countries are still struggling with, obviously in Myanmar, Burma, you know, etc. Um, and you know they've we've managed to overcome them only to create uh, other roadblocks to you know tolerance and kindness on our own. And what I'm trying to say is that that's not an accident. That's again because of segregation, which then leads to legal mechanisms to maintain that segregation. In this case, gerrymandering which then has all kinds of other consequences, both intended and unintended. And what I'm trying to say is that if you are a minority in America under a democratic system, you have to understand that, you know, in the, in the old days, when you didn't have people doing, when you, when you didn't have an entire legal system um, functioning in ways to, that maintain segregation, both politically and economically, uh, there were many ways to be successful. Um, you know, you could come into a university and then you could, you know, study here and then move to a, a place that might be in that top 10 um, economically and succeed. And nobody would necessarily care, uh, you know, because, again, it was something that was, something that was based on merit. Um, and it's tragic that America is, is experiencing these sorts of problems today simply because it's such a big country. You know, it's not small like, like Hong Kong. Um, and yet... Given the size, you can you can do a simple you know sort of analysis. It's just sort of off you know off the napkin, uh, on the napkin analysis, which is you know if you look at Canada, which only has has a tiny population, but it, it's got at least at least two cities that are would be considered mega cities, right? Toronto and Vancouver, but the U.S. with a much larger population, much much larger, um, again really arguably only has about ten cities that would be comparable. Um, and again, that's the tragedy of segregation, is that the money and the capital flow only to a small number of places, thereby um, increasing segregation, and in many cases, ideological segregation in smaller places that are not uh, receiving that same capital, or at least that don't have the same access to capital, 
uh, certainly not on a merit-based system, um, as a lot of these other cities um, that are, again, for political reasons, uh, receiving a lot of the largesse, uh, whether it's taxpayer or venture capital and so on, private versus public. And so what, what I'm trying to say is when you look at something, when th these all have consequences. Segregation has consequences um, that smaller countries don't have to deal with. They have other problems, but it's much harder to segregate when you're in a small you know, landmass with a smaller population of six, seven, eight million people. You really have to go out of your way if, if you're in that position. You have to have checkpoints. You have to convert into a, you almost have to become a military state in order to enforce segregation if you are small. Um, and, and that, again, has consequences, right? Um, both of which lead you away from tolerance and kindness and all the other values that go into a community. And the fact of the matter is it's, it's exhausting to maintain segregation. You have to have an entire legal structure which then th that maintains it, which then tends to, to seep over into the economic system. And once that happens, you know, it, it very much is a – it changes the slope of progress from up – you know, it, it just changes it completely. Uh, and the reason being is that, you know, people are very comfortable when they're in charge of their you know, political system, which allows them to choose their police officers, their firefighters, and so on. And one of the reasons affirmative action and diversity uh, came into play in the U.S. is because that political system was so segregated to the point where an African-American, even in Chicago, was unable to get a job as a firefighter, um, you know, without some sort of special um, process. And and this is not this is not necessarily, necessarily changed but at this point, I'm trying to discuss, you know, how we got to this place and what to look for if you are a minority. And in my case, I decided that I'm, I'm hoping to look for a smaller place uh, that is able to avoid these issues, um, you know, w without the need for legal mechanisms. In other words, it's just in inherent that you're not going to have segregation and therefore you have to live together. And because you have to get to live, you have to live together, you have to get used to each other. Um, and the question is whether or not, how do you create at that point an environment of tolerance and kindness? Because it's not necessarily true that just because you don't have segregation that you're going to be tolerant and kind. It takes, it still takes an effort. Um, but in, in the, the, the contrast, my, my status quo today is in an environment where every, everything is stacked against these values. And this takes me back to what I was trying to say earlier uh, before I started jumping around, is that the legal system then needs economic segregation. And so, again, here in, in San Jose, which is one of, the, one of the largest cities in America, I believe it's still in the, in the top 10 uh, where I live. Uh, in the last election, both mayors went to the same private high school. And I believe that private high school costs at least $17,000 a year today. Uh, it may not be quite that much, uh, but it's still going to be about $10,000, depending on the level of aid that you get. And, you know, when you have that, again, that, that political system then leaves the economic consequences. Because once again, if you look at the, you know, not just the city council, but the county, which is, you know, a, a different area that's, you know, that interlinks with, between uh, what is designated as a city and what is designated as a county. In many cases, they're, you know, sort of crossing over each other uh, or, or around each other in the same general area. Uh, you end up in another situation where suddenly the police chief also went to a private Catholic high school, uh, just like the mayors did. And so you start to see, a, you know, a response by what a lot of people would call the establishment, for lack of, for lack of a better word, uh, to try to fix those issues without giving up their own uh, power or privilege. And one way you do that is, is through programs like Americans, we would call them affirmative action, uh, or you simply start promoting people into a small number of positions um, that, that do not necessarily reflect the underlying, or the 90% of the people that are actually employees. So if you have a, a, a police force that's, you know, 75%, um, one race, one way to sort of try to fix that in, in a public perception or in the public eye in order to increase your confidence, uh, or public confidence without which almost anything is impossible. Um, you know, to do the, one, one way of doing that is by promoting somebody into a leadership position, a visible one, uh, that's not of the same race as the majority of the people underneath uh, that person uh, in, in an effort to display uh, or signal tolerance. Uh, but there's only so many ways you can do that because, again, what ends up happening is the people in the city council, the people in the county are, have a lot of power. And uh, they, they're able to figure out which nonprofits might get grants or at least they're able to put people in contact with each other to help, you know, to help uh, lubricate that process. And so you have this public sector that's being very, very um, insular. And then once again, that has consequences. 
Uh, and these consequences cannot be overcome by things like, you know, 10, 20, 30 scholarships to a private school in order to give the appearance of diversity when the underlying foundation is that is really that unless you go to a private high school, something that you yourself as a child have very little control over, chances are you're not going to be part of that power structure. Chances are that the democratic system is not going to need to respond to you and that you are going to be dependent on the kindness of strangers as opposed to having a, a, a strong voice um, and one that is uh, at least on an equal playing field. And what ends up happening is when you have that system, uh, the economic system changes. Now, this isn't just in San Jose. If you go to another city that would be in the top 10 in America in terms of economic output and places to live or places you would want to live, one of them, I think Seattle would be in there, right? Um, and if you look at one of the uh, people on that city council um, or one of the elected representatives, um, she is, I believe, an Indian American. Uh, but if you look at what high school she went to, she went to a high school in Jakarta. I think it's called the Jakarta International School. Now, you look at the price tag, it's $30,000 a year. So you start to see all of these institutions that are designed to help attract talent, uh, like what used to be schools, um, you know, all the way from kindergarten all the way to college. You start to see them as becoming de facto segregation um, agents. And once again, that has problems. And, and I don't want to – I can't get into it you know, now simply because it's a different topic. Uh, but, you know, the biggest problem with segregation is it puts you out of touch with with everyone else. And when it does that, and if, once you're in that system, um, you end up trying to fix the problem uh, in ways that don't change the foundational issues. Uh, like I said, one way is affirmative action. One way is promoting people uh, into visible positions of power uh, without changing the hiring process that would lead to, um, you know, or, ordinary citizens or ordinary residents uh, receiving necessarily or receiving a, a better process that is linked to merit rather than what high school you want to. Uh, so in other words, if just because somebody is, 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 you know, a visible minority in a lieutenant position, that person might set policy, but what really matters is the hiring process and the retention process at a lower level because the lower level employees are the ones that you as a resident will be dealing with. And leadership matters. It absolutely matters. But it also matters that the people um, in a city or a county or a state understand that the people they're dealing with or likely to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are among the best people, not necessarily, not among the people that just happen to have a, um, a victory in, in the genetic, genetic lottery or in the educational lottery. Um, and so what I'm trying to say is getting back to the other situation, if you are a minority in the U.S. with you know, somebody, who, somebody who lacks political representation, you know, what is the best thing to do? Um, and I think as I, you know, try to study this issue uh, more, and I'm coming to the realization that, you know, it's very difficult for a country that's, that runs on military spending um, to do, to behave in a way that goes counter to that economic system. And what I mean by that is a country that runs on military spending must always have an enemy. And, and, and that's how you justify, you know, that, that, that kind of an economic system, that kind of spending, rather than a system that, that you know, is perhaps... Um, a little bit more equitable or, the, the, or one that's geared towards, you know, trying to uh, create a system based on, on merit um, that is, that really is, that really creates a, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, again, it's difficult for me to come up with the words because, um, you know, if I were creating an, econ an economic system from scratch, I would not put military spending as the, the primary uh, driver of, of an economy. Um, I would do something, you know, neither would you. Uh, but but if you did that, um, you would have to again. You know there are other consequences to that, um, and I think the U.S. is trying to move away from that somewhat. Um, but the corporations, the private sector, have, uh, as of today, they have four trillion dollars in debt that's coming due or maturing over the next five years. So you have a, a system that recognizes that R and D is oftentimes research and development is oftentimes unpredictable, and you know if you have ten projects maybe one or none of them will be successful. And so the people that are most able to drive research uh, into new frontiers are going to be people that have access to, or that can lose money, or that have access to hypothetically an infinite amount of money, uh, and that would be countries, right? But you know, the idea is that countries never die. And so if you have to go in debt, that's okay, because eventually you'll be able to at least service the debt. 
Uh, and the same thing with major corporations. It's very difficult to envision like an Amazon going out of business, uh, given their leadership and the platform that they have today and the barriers to entry. That's not to say it won't ever happen, um, but you can see once again that you know we are all moving towards a system that prioritizes or that values big over small. And but also, you know, when when you think about that in a framework of segregation, uh, you see that a lot of the so-called solutions are are going to be ineffective at at altering uh, the foundational economic system um, that that gives that gives rise to these these big corporations, um, as well as you know a lot of other um, you know entities that are linked to that. So, for example, Amazon uh, Amazon's cloud services um, then you know bids for a contract with the military. So this is, again, another situation where when you get big, you have to look for other big entities because uh, that's where the money is. You know, they're the ones that can afford to pay you uh, the amount of money that, you, you know, that, that allows you to grow um, at a reasonable rate. Um, and so you see a lot more M&A, you see a lot more mergers and, mergers and acquisitions. But again, that, that's from a minority perspective, uh, from you know, where do you want to live? What I'm trying to say is that you have to look for a lot of different signs and you want to look for... Um, places that emphasize tolerance and kindness, um, because you can have all the money in the world. You can have, you can even be the leader in, you know, um, technology um, and in military um, innovation. But you can also think of a time when Germany was a leader in military innovation. And you have to ask yourself, as a minority, you know, what really matters? Do I want to live in a place where the majority um, can turn against me? Um, overnight, uh, or do I want to live in a place that's you know that again has a system that might be more conducive to creating a community where individuals have more power over their own future, uh, especially in a way that's not linked to big organizations that oftentimes might have ideological or educational or other barriers to entry that are not necessarily within your own grasp. Anyway, I, I've rambled on quite a bit here, um, and uh, but ho hopefully we've um, come up with some interesting points to talk about. Take care.